I am on a mission. I am on a mission to hack my classroom, your classroom, and every classroom across the globe. I am on a mission to expose as many kids to coding and computer science as I can. I feel very strongly it should be embedded in practice, but before we can truly implement it, we have to hack a few criteria of our education system. Let me begin with my story. In 2006, I started my first after-school coding club with kids. In 2006, I first coined the term co-learner because I was exploring the Scratch platform with grade seven and eight students. In 2006, a grade eight student approached me and said, I want to code a game. As we talked further, I thought he might be interested in doing something like Pac-Man or Tetris or Space Invaders, but he said, oh, I said, <laughs> Mr. A, I have the greatest idea ever. And I said, pitch it, what do you want to do? And he said, I want to create the pooping baby. <laughs> you laugh. The pooping baby radically changed how I teach mathematics to this day, a decade later. You see, this student coded that pooping baby to translate across a Cartesian grid by changing x variables from positive to negative. This student made that pooping baby flip when it touched the perimeter of the screen. This student plotted points on a Cartesian grid because he wanted the poop missiles to appear based on the baby's location and then translate to the bottom of the screen where the player of the game had to catch said poop missiles. <laughs> For every poop missile caught, a score value would increment by one. And in 2006, I watched this child construct their own knowledge of mathematics without any explicit teaching. Now, the coding movement started long before my time. In 1981, Seymour Papert wrote Mindstorms. In it, he claimed that students should construct their own knowledge of mathematics by doing kinesthetic activities. He stated that if we want children to find the perimeter of this room, then perhaps they should walk it themselves using their footsteps as a unit of measure. If students could tell you the solution algorithmically and then replicate it on the computer, they had not only grasped the concepts, but they had successfully applied it. 30 years ago, Seymour Papert worked with MIT and developed what we call today a block coding language called Logo. In that application, students would code a turtle to move around the screen to draw two-dimensional shapes. Today we have Mitch Resnick and his team at MIT working on Scratch. But what so many people don't realize is Scratch is over 13 years old, developed in 2003 based on the principles of passion, projects, peers, and play. And I'm standing before you today because I believe coding alone is no longer enough. In 2006, when I was watching this student work on the pooping baby, Jeanette Wing was working for Microsoft and doing research. In 2006, she wrote a very pivotal paper. In it, she defined computational thinking as critical thinking plus the power of the computer to solve problems we couldn't have prior. In 2006, Wing stated that computational thinking is no longer just a skill for computer scientists but the society at large, because by 2020, we will have more objects connected to the internet than people. That means your fridge will send you an Instagram photo of a dirty water filter. That means your stove will Snapchat you when the oven is at temperature. And that means for the first time in human history, we will have more vehicles connected to the internet than not. Self-driving cars alone will eliminate thousands of jobs, but thousands more will be created through these new technologies. We now live in a world where people don't believe they need post-secondary education to be successful in life. We are in the era of startups, makerspace, and 3D printing. Two years ago, internet user Michael Tiao created the first Raspberry Pi magic mirror. It's been replicated dozens of times since and improved upon, but he had an idea 
and he used his computational thinking skills two years ago. He coded a piece of software sitting on a Raspberry Pi connected to a computer monitor to display the weather, time, and news highlights because it was mounted behind a one-way mirror. Internet user Jianu successfully connected a redstone switch in Minecraft to a physical lamp in his living room connected to Wi-Fi. He had to actually write code in Minecraft to pull this off using hexadecimal in order to dim that light. I believe all kids should have the opportunity to make, but that making doesn't necessarily require technology. I do believe what kids make should be shared with technology to a global audience for authentic feedback. Having said that, let me tell you the story about Zach Danger Brown and his mission to make potato salad and share it with the world. Zach Danger Brown took the Kickstarter because he needed to raise some money and he thought it would be fun to try. On his Kickstarter campaign, he pitched an idea and he said, I want to make potato salad. I'm going to a party. I want to impress people. I need $60 <laughs> to make potato salad. If you pledge $5 to my campaign, I will say your name on camera as I record myself, thanking you while I make potato salad for the first time. <laughs> well, the internet loves these kinds of stories. <laughs> this story went viral, and 6,911 people pledged, and he raised over $55,000 to make potato salad because that is the world in which we live. True to his word, and because the internet wouldn't have allowed it otherwise, he said every name on a live Google Hangout, and it took four hours to do. People games LLC, Nick, Nick Amico, Nick Baker, Nick Brock, Nick Cesari, Nick Chow, Nick Coolahan, Nick D. Clements, Nick DeMorest, Nick Douglas, <clears throat> Nick Gerhardt, Nick Gill, Nick Griparis. Now, all my kids were talking about this, so I thought, OK, I have to turn this into a lesson. So based solely on the fact that $55,000 were raised, let's have a conversation about data management. We talked about bias. We made graphs. We looked at trends. We talked about internet advertising. And I thought, I can't stop here. See, at this point in time, Weird Al had a top 10 hit. So I brought this story into my language program, and we started to talk about parody. I have a dream. A dream to make bean salad for the first time. But I can't do it myself. No, I'm not in possession of $10. That's why I launched a Kickstarter to make bean salad with Jonathan for the first time. I've never made bean salad. I don't think I like bean salad. I probably don't. But we'll never find out unless we get this Kickstarter. Unless you give us our money, or your money, and it becomes our money. And then we can do wonderful things like you pick a bean for us to put in the salad, a type of bean, garbanzo, pinto, black-eyed peas, chickpeas. Or we can Photoshop your head onto our finalized bean salad. And of course, we will be worshiping you verbally on Rigothis. It's a deal. Help us make it happen. Send us your dollars. Let us fart. Did you say send us your daughters? I mean, I mean that's OK, too, as long as they're not underage. The idea of creating content and sharing it with the world has led me to hack number one. Before I truly believe we can implement coding, computer science, STEM, STEAM, and makerspace, we have to find the balance between solely regurgitating content at school and solely creating content at school. Somewhere in that middle ground, we have to encourage students to create solutions and not just find them. Hack number two, the notion of embracing failure is something we talk about in schools a lot under the idea of taking risks. But right now, we live in a system where failure is punished. When kids fail, they are asked to stay after school, stay in at recess, or even worse, repeat a course. Rovio spent six years failing before they made Angry Birds. Angry Birds was the 52nd app Rovio ever made. If we had taken those Rovio coders and put them into an educational setting, we would have asked them to repeat the exact same process, but expected a different result. Hack number three, 
the notion of time. For so long, time has been a constant at school. We put kids in isolated settings, start a timer, and then judge them based on what they are able to produce at the end of that time. There is not one educator in this room that doesn't believe all kids can achieve. Having that mindset and providing the appropriate tools, technologies, and time, then perhaps grades needs to be that constant and time the floating variable. Once we've got the time component figured out, we can then focus more on the process of learning as well as that endpoint. I want to share two stories from my classroom that support my claim. Last year, this student came to my classroom with a thick OSR. He is autistic, and early in the year, his parents requested a meeting with myself, the principal, and the resource teacher. In the meeting, Dad stood up, and he began to read. I have a dream. I have a dream that someday my child will be a functioning member of society. I have a dream that someday my child will be able to hold down a job financially and have conversations with people like you and I are right now. But until you change something about his school system, that is not going to happen. He is autistic. Why do you focus on his weaknesses at school when he's going to pursue his strengths in life? My son has millions of pieces of Lego, and I can pull one at random and ask him what kit it goes into, and he can tell me every time. But for some reason, my child's report card tells me that my child is dumb. And as I'm listening to this story, I'm thinking about Lego, and I'm thinking about linking cubes, and I'm thinking about block coding, and I'm thinking about Minecraft. So the next day, I said to him, I don't want you to use your words, and I don't want you to write. I want you to take this picture from this textbook and build it in Minecraft. When you have finished that, I want you to then build what you think the next few images might look like. And the point of my story is it took a very long time. But at the end of this process, this child was successful in producing something that shows he could demonstrate the curriculum expectations for growing patterns. And this is what he built. Go. That is much softer than silicon, so this might give him the edge he needs. Research shows that spatial reasoning skills are an indicator of future success in schools, and this is a perfect piece of evidence demonstrating the ability of this particular student. My second story is also from a student of last year's class. Early in the year, I taught him to code in the Scratch environment, and he used it as a tool to demonstrate his own creative thought. He used it as a tool to give him a voice in other classrooms. He approached other teachers and said, can I code apps and games in your classrooms? And our French teacher said, better yet, can you code me something I can use to teach other students? And together, they created this project in which he had recreated the original Zelda from the original Nintendo with this top-down sort of castle example. In the game, the character Link would say the directions en français, and the player of the game had to then determine, either through trial and error or by knowing the direction, which door to go through. If Link went through the wrong door, he would then start all over. But through this entire process, I watched this student construct his own knowledge authentically of the entire strand of grade eight geometry. He made Link translate, he made Link flip, he made Link dilate, he made Link turn and move, and he plotted points on a Cartesian grid without any explicit teaching. The point of this story is he spent three and a half weeks, 60 minutes a day in French class, 40 minutes a day in math class. His parents reported him working on this thing for hours at night and on weekends. And it's like the tip of the iceberg metaphor. I recorded myself playing his game, and the student product he produced is only about 15 seconds long. You will not see the countless hours he spent failing, trying again, getting immediate feedback from the computer, seeking experts, collaborating, and getting on the internet to try and research new ideas.
doesn't look like much. Consider the fact that he spent countless hours and was determined to pull this thing off and to have his French teacher then use it as a teaching tool. You can tell from looking at the syntax of this game, there is evidence of mathematics. He plotted points. He made Link move up by making Y a positive. He made Link move down by making Y a negative. Microsoft is investing $75 million in computer science education because for the first time, Python is more popular than French in elementary schools. The BBC is putting a micro bit in every kid's hand to teach coding, STEM, and STEAM technologies. Australia is scrapping history and geography and replacing it with coding. British Columbia and Nova Scotia have recently announced that they're going to implement computer science in the near future. And what do we care about in Ontario? <laughs> Data. And I'm not suggesting that that's a bad thing. Benchmarks are a good idea, but we need to open our eyes and realize if we want to improve mathematical thinking and reduce mathematical anxiety, then perhaps we should also look at computational thinking because there is a significant overlap between the two principles. Microsoft believes that every kid should be expo exposed to coding, not because every kid will be a professional coder, but because you don't know if you like broccoli until you try it. By, <laughs> by 2020, there will be more things connected to the internet than people. There will be more jobs in the tech sector than qualified people to fill those positions. And I know this is scary, and I know this is overwhelming, and I know this is intimidating. But we have to remember, it's not about us. We need to stop trying to make kids conform to our world, but instead embrace theirs. Thank you.